use every day up until August the 2nd to um, power to their own constituencies, if you like, to make sure they can get something out of it for themselves and give themselves a bit of a profile. But I also think that they made a bit of a boo-boo, like, according to a news report I heard this morning, they didn't get their sums right as far as how much money is required. No, no that's right. I mean, that, 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 yeah, no, that's right. They're, they're at a $14.3 trillion, um, deficit, and they want, to, they want to raise that ceiling for um, a period of time to some level. Now, there's all sorts of numbers that are being thrown about. I mean, it's anyone's guess um, just how much they want for how long. But do you think how big 14.3 trillion is? I mean, in New Zealand, we're talking millions, hundreds of millions, and indeed billions, I suppose, because our economy, our economy alone is worth about $200 billion a year. We're talking these guys wanting to borrow more than the 14.3 trillion they currently have. That's about the size of their economy in any one year, about 14 trillion. So we're, we're, we're considering New Zealand borrowing 200 billion dollars in one year just to run the economy. So it's, it's astonishing numbers, and it shows how sick the American economy is. It absolutely is. But I suppose, though, what they have to do is just print money, and that's surely going to cause inflation, won't it? Yeah, they've done that before. <laughs> We've seen economists print money, and, uh, and, and, and Bernanke at the Fed Reserve has done that um, already a number of times. They've got the lowest interest rates around. Uh, I think that's 0.5% is the official cash rate over there, or the equivalent of the official cash rate. So um, I'm not sure they can actually print much more money. They've done that. It hasn't had much of an impact. And um, it, as you say, the impacts on inflation. I mean, we, we've got inflation here about 5.3%. We can't just go printing money for that very reason. So printing money, it might seem like the simple solution has been done before, but long term it has no impact on your economy. In fact, you go backwards. It sounds to me very much like uh, the, 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 the political policy of the Social Credit Party way back in the yeah, 60s. Yeah, the $3 note, now, the $3 on... note from your area. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, Duncan, the, the, the John Key's visit, I guess it says something about the kudos that may be that he holds, that Obama was able to come out of the talks and actually talk to John Key, even though he was in the middle of that hiatus. Yeah, I don't think we should underestimate that either, and uh, I think you make a good point. I mean, um, whew, I mean, we were in Washington just for a couple of days, and Obama was completely sidetracked by this whole debt crisis. Um, just at the airport here, as, a, as a, one of the jets goes past, it must be Tom Cruise out here with um, Peter Jackson. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, there's all sorts of players around Wellington at the moment. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, completely sidetracked. He still had 35-odd minutes with Key, and you'd think at the end of the day, who really wants to see John Key when you've got America's economy on his knees? He may well have wanted some advice. I mean, what I found over there was that the um, <laughs> top finance guys like Geithner Treasury Secretary and Bernanke from the Fed Reserve, they actually know Key. They've dealt with him before in the private sector uh, when he was a, when he was a banker, and um, I think they actually respect what he's got to say. I mean, it's a bit of another man's language, isn't it? The banking sector and the uh, Fed Reserve and you know economies and things. So um, I think they quite enjoy and speaking to him. Uh, but I, I mean, I right. tell you what, I, I, I know the last ten years the Labor Party put a lot of work into that American relationship. They were always seen as anti-American. They tried really hard. Clark did a lot of work. She got a big red carpet entrance there in two thousand. In seven, so don't underestimate that a lot of the work had been done, and Key kind of came in on a lot of those coattails. Banks have ended up in the position, as Bernard Hickey has said a time or two on the panel, where they have the franchise on the creation of money, and governments put banks in this position and could very easily change the rules, a revolutionary paper by the International Monetary Fund claims that you could eliminate the net public debt, for example, of the United States at a stroke and by implication do the same for Britain and Germany and Italy and Japan. Joining us is Westpac New Zealand senior economist Michael Gordon. Michael, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. So I suppose at the back of this discussion, is there, is there any real reason we ask why there has to be this deep and fast flowing river of capital? flowing out of our economy into the banks uh, across the ditch. Well, well, you've, you've seen, I think, the essential argument, I think we sent you the story out of the Telegraph, which attempts to analyse it, of this interesting paper, and widely discussed, discussed now, out of the International Monetary Fund, about whether we could just essentially, you know, flick away all this mm. global debt. Is it possible? 
Um, I think it's, it's certainly possible to have this kind of arrangement. Um, this, this IMF paper um, is, is really revisiting a plan that was, was really born out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, it does a lot of soul searching about how did we get ourselves into this position in the first place. And uh, I think it's, it's sort of come up again, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, where they are again asking how did we get ourselves in this position in the first place. Um, I, I mean, I'm certainly not uh, uh, sort of too well versed in the, in the exact details of the plan, but um, I, I guess you can sort of really put it on a, it's, it's on a spectrum of sort of possible plans of controlling the money supply. Um, really, I mean, money is it's, it doesn't have value in itself, but it's a useful thing. So it, you know, it is it is useful to sort of have it in society. Um, but you really need some sort of control on it, so you don't have people um, effectively sort of granting themselves more of this um, essentially valueless but still useful product. I don't. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I mean I don't pretend to understand, and I think the um, the economics editor of the Telegraph is in a similar position. Uh, their entire suggestion, but essentially, isn't it, Michael, that um, credit cycle trauma caused by private money creation uh, dates deep into history and lies at the root of what they say is necessary to solve the problem, and that's periodic debt jubilees which used to be held throughout history. And in simple terms, what they're saying is that we're in the kind of impasse that has only been solved in the past by a forgiving of debt, a debt jubilee of some sort. Would that sum it up? Um, I think that that's one aspect of it. This, um, the, the plan that the IMF uh, paper was, was looking at was um, effectively more about um, who, uh, I guess sort of who dictates the overall growth in the money supply. Um, and th th there are a range of approaches you can take to this. Uh, you can ultimately, someone's got to be the adult and, and sort of say, you know, establish some discipline about it, uh, which is why, for example, we have independent central banks. So this issue of um, the, the growth in the money supply is, um, doesn't get politicised. Um, and I think we've, we've, we've kind of been through at least a decade or so of uh, a period where um, you know, central banks, while being independent, were, were probably a little bit lax. They, they ran very loose monetary policy. We had very rapid growth in the money supply, um, very rapid growth in asset prices, but they kind of said, well, it's, it's not our problem. We deal with, deal with consumer prices. And I think that's, there's a little bit of soul searching going on um, all around the world in, in that aspect of it. Um, I guess I mean, the, the issue about, uh, I guess, the, I mean, bank profits, uh, I mean, my, uh, I guess my starting point for that is New Zealand um, still has this imbalance between um, this, between saving and investment here. We're still, um, you know, effectively, um, you know, borrowing a lot more than than, than the nation saves. Um, that you know that gets funded from offshore and and by and large it gets channeled through banks because they have the name out there and the reputation to uh, you know to raise the money from overseas. And I think uh, I think to some degree bank profits kind of reflect that the, the fact that they have that um, the access to international markets. But the bottom line is. Um, even if that wasn't the case, I think we'd still be paying a lot of money offshore. It would just be less in the form of bank profits and more in the form of interest. Um, the fundamental problem is, um, is, is, is the fact that we, we have this great need to, or I like, guess great desire to borrow from overseas in the first place. It's, it's the IMF paper, not to get bogged down in it, but one more question on it, sure. uh, is essentially making the point that uh, the control of credit growth would become much more straightforward because banks wouldn't be able, as they are today, to generate their own funding, uh, and which is an extraordinary privilege not enjoyed by any other type of business, says the IMF paper. And banks would become what many erroneously believe them to be today, pure intermediaries that depend on obtaining outside funding before being able to lend. Is there some truth in that? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the, the proposition that banks make money for themselves I don't think is right. Um, ba banks can create money for their customers, not for themselves. Um, there, there's quite an important distinction there. And, you know, uh, people borrow from banks. For, they don't, they, I mean, they don't do it for fun. There's a reason. There's, there's usually some intent, some understanding that it's, um, it's going into some, some productive purpose. Um, but, but, I mean, coming back to the heart of the, uh, the, the IMF paper, the idea is it's really more about... Um, a shift from uh, the, the role of credit creation. It's away from banks, but it's really putting more of the onus onto the state, which is why I mentioned you've got to have someone be the adult and someone to actually say, you know, we are going to limit uh, growth in the money supply to X amount. And Michael, very nice of you to join us on this. Thank you very much. So it's got its gainsayers, but it's also got its supporters. The guy who coined the term quantitative easing, Professor Richard Werner, he says that a switch to state money would have major welfare gains, and he's backed by a few other groups as well. 
but I think it's regarded at the moment as a fringe paper. But it might not be in a couple of years if nothing else solves the problem. Yeah, probably, but although you don't want to get the state um, too heavily involved in um, monetary systems if you can avoid it. But you'd still try to have some kind of a free market, free... I think, think most surprise. people would be quite surprised, most lay people uh, were very surprised to learn that the Federal Reserve wasn't in fact part of the American government in any way, shape or form, and was in fact a private bank. And uh, I think uh, most people would probably think that the state was already much more involved in these processes, internationally anyway, than, uh, than they are in fact. Yeah.